land of Adi Shankara, the great Indian philosopher who brought to the world the message of Advaita. From early childhood onwards, Justice Kurian Joseph has been a hardcore Catholic and grown to the heights of Supreme Court judge through Catholic pious movements and associations. Proudly, I recall one unforgettable experience with Justice Kurian Joseph. In 1998, he came to the Vatican to take part in the Asian Synod. And the cardinal in charge was Hetchagarai, and he welcomed him to the Synod of Bishops uh, in the presence of Pope St. John Paul II as the Supreme Court judge in India. Kurian Joseph began his intervention stating and correcting, I am not Supreme Court judge, but only a High Court judge. Then the Cardinal told him that one day you will become the Supreme Court judge of India. And that prophecy realized on 8th March 2013. The most important daily duty in his life is participation in the Holy Mass and reception of the Holy Communion. I could say this because he comes to our Ashram Chapel for the daily Holy Mass. He not only participates daily in the Eucharistic sacrifice, but also lives a Eucharistic sharing life. For instance, he donated his heritage property to MCBS for the rehabilitation of beggars called FBA, Friends of the Birds of the Air, founded by Father George Quittigal MCBS, one of the pioneers of PMI also. You might have read about him in the September issue of Prison Voice. And this land today serves as the headquarters of Friends of the Birds of the Air. Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph is a great devotee of Blessed Virgin Mary. And many asked me to call him for the talk on Mother Mary. When I called him, he accepted our invitation with gentleness and humility. That is uh, the two great virtues of Mother Mary. And uh, dear Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph, most cordially, I welcome to this PMI online retreat. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> unmute, unmute. Yeah, thank you, Father. Uh, Kurian, that is, uh, you have clicked to so many uh, memories of long back. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in 1998, I was not a judge at all. I was only really a lawyer. So I said, Holy Father, if, with uh, your support, become a judge. I'm not a judge yet. This was my response. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And for your information, my second intervention, I was called uh, Bishop Joseph Kurian. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I told, uh, I'm not a bishop yet, but I don't mind becoming one. <laughs> Two interesting uh, episodes there in that Senate. That is something very, uh, very wonderful. And it was um, for Francis who helped us to formulate uh, my position there in the interventions also. I remember the gratitude, those things. And thank you for all the introduction <laughs> that you gave to me. It's wonderful to have um, um, a session like this, an online retreat. In online retreat, uh, we think about ourselves, we think about uh, those people who have been understood or custody, care, and this is what we do. And in particular, our father has asked me to concentrate on uh, the mother Mary. And just yesterday only, day for yesterday, yes, day for the, yesterday, yesterday, we celebrated the feast of uh, the seven sorrows 
and we are dealing with the people who have 70 sorrows. <laughs> our ministry had only seven, but if we people in the prison ministry, when we meet people in the prisons, they will tell us uh, it's not seven, we have 70. <laughs> that is the type of uh, the people who are uh, dealing with. But just coming to ourselves, uh, well, since we are all engaged uh, in this uh, particular ministry, uh, mind you, it is not a service, it's a ministry. There's a lot of difference between service and ministry. In the uh, disciples of uh, the discipleship of Jesus, there is only ministry, there is no service according to me. The apostles and disciples have been called to be ministers, to be in the ministry of uh, this evangelization the ministry of uh, Jesus to be continued. And we have the first Christian in that model that is Mother Mary. It's the first tabernacle and the first Christian. She is a model for so many things. Uh, I'm sure you would have heard about uh, so many things uh, about uh, Mother Mary. And to me particularly I have a very special attachment to Mother Mary because the first uh, uh, prayer I learned uh, on the lap of my mother was uh, my mother, my refuge. Uh, this was the first uh, ejaculation I learned from my mother. From then onwards, uh, I've been clinging to Mother Mary and uh, I used to pray to her that even if I leave your hand, don't leave your hand from my hands. Hold on to my hand even if I shirk away from your hand. And I can tell you, uh, I have seen several, several, several such uh, miracles and uh, uh, you know, situations where with the help of uh, Mother Mary helping me uh, in my spiritual, in my temporal, in my professional life, you know, taking me through, in, um, through rough seas, quite calmly. Uh, and uh, the, the, the virtue of uh, simplicity, I have learned from Mother Mary also. Unless, uh, this is what I learned, simplicity and holiness are the two sides of um, the same discipleship. Simplicity and holiness, unless uh, we are simple, we can't be holy. And we are, if we are to be holy, we are to be simple. And we are called to be holiness. So unless we have this, uh, uh, what do you call, um, this sense of being simple and humble before God, we cannot uh, claim ourselves to be holy. And unless we are holy, we cannot engage ourselves in the service of the people. Because uh, the type of people whom we deal with are those people who are already in deep trouble. So unless we have that moral strength of uh, holiness, we will not be in a position to tackle their issues. Otherwise, we ourselves get into more troubles. This is uh, what sometimes uh, most of us uh, have gone through also. Unless we are clean in our mind and clear in our conscience and accepting with the humility that, you know, without the assistance of God, and without the support of um, the saints, and particularly the, the, the guidance of Mother Mary, you know, we won't be in a position to tell the people that you know, we have come to give you love. Because all those who are in presence are people who have lost love, who have been disconnected from love. So they don't expect a simple compassion. They expect a meaningful compassion from us. And this meaningful compassion, all of us have to learn from Mother Mary. What is this, uh, what you call real essential meaning of compassion? That essential meaning of compassion is love with understanding leading to responsibility. That's the first instance uh, itself we see from the ministry of Mother Mary. She loved her aunt. She understood that she is in need. And then she took up the responsibility of um, going and serving her for uh, three months. So her presence itself was uh, accepted as a blessing. So the question 
probably we may have to ask ourselves is our presence actually accepted and respected uh, by the people maybe the prisoners or wherever we are uh, engaged in the ministry if not it is not their problem it's actually our problem because unless this uh, spirit of uh, holiness and simplicity and humility radiates then you know that was that person or that those persons uh, will not be in a position to accept our presence and respect our uh, intervention so this acceptance and uh, respect of our intervention be it in any ministry be it a person be it anywhere else or be for the authorities wherever you are you know that requires a lot of moral strength and that moral strength uh, is to be displayed in our um, uh, humility in our simplicity and in our holiness so look at the example of saint peter when he was uh, walking and then he saw at the, that the gate of golden temple so he was uh, the man with the, the 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 beggar sitting there was looking at uh, him as if you know big and extending his arms to get some arm to some help but what was peter's response peter's response this is a big challenge to us peter's response was that what you ask i don't have but what you need i have this is very uh, very interesting and he he challenged that person to look at me look at me what you actually desire is gold and silver but that is not in me that is not with me but what you deserve or what you need is something else which i have in plenty this uh, is a great challenge to us we should be in a position to be honestly and uh, full of accountability and transparency be in a position to be as simple as plain before those people and tell them that you know what you actually deserve is not actually what you need so this discernment of what we what those people need is uh, uh, it, it will be available to us only if we have that clean and clear in our uh, mind and conscience that the gold and silver have i none but this is what you deserve but this is not what you need what you need is actually the 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 the, the real liberation which i can give you through jesus which uh, whom i have uh, in fullness so jesus in fullness if you uh, need to claim if we need to claim we should not have the other thing we should not have the craze for power the craze for money the craze for position the craze for uh, um, recognition the craze for publicity these are all the attitudes you know which mother mary always eschewed away she never ever came into the limelight she never wanted to be in limelight also but at the same time she was omnipresent in this in the sense you know omnipresent in the sense uh, throughout the journey of uh, jesus in the way of the cross because the whole life of jesus was a way of the cross it doesn't uh, simply start from the first station up to the 14th no from the very beginning the very moment of conception knowing fully well that she is a virgin and she is going uh, going to take up a challenge of conceiving a child in the womb and going to be seen among the public that you know a person who had taken a vow has conceived she was fully aware of everything else but she was in a position to be perfectly uh, you know in the path of uh, jesus because uh, she was convinced and uh, she consciously took upon herself that you know that shall be that nothing shall be in her nothing shall be with her which would actually prevent uh, this pursuit of uh, pursuit in the path of uh, jesus to be with jesus so uh, i put it uh, this way faith in jesus and faithfulness to jesus in faithfulness to jesus mother mary is the 
leading light before all of us uh, being simply faithful to Jesus. And uh, the, the other quality probably I would like to just recollect uh, in our, the context of the ministry we are in. It's actually, I see Mother Mary as a great team leader. This is something which uh, we have uh, heartily discussed. She's a great team leader. What is the role of a team leader? Team leader, and we always claim, you know, we always, we probably might have heard also, there's no limit to what we can achieve, provided it does not matter as to who gets the credit. So Mother Mary never ever claimed the credit. But she was always present wherever her presence was required and she had her contribution. But she did not want her contribution to recognize. The team leadership comes uh, uh, towards the end of the gospel passages where we see after the resurrection. Uh, people, you know, the, the disciples also were quite frustrated and they went away. But the Mother Mary called them together and, you know, again gave them the real strength and fire and brought fire in them also, rekindled their uh, faith by bringing them together. So the team leadership, uh, in the team leadership also, Mother Mary is a great model. And uh, these are the two, three qualities uh, which I really wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, reflect on today when we think about uh, our ministry and uh, the Mother Mary's role. Uh, I, I was just also thinking, the first question uh, probably God would like to ask to every one of us, every time, is the same question which God asks, where are you? Where are you? And probably this is the question we have to ask those people also whom we meet in the persons, because they must be in a position to accept the reality that uh, they have landed in the prison. Maybe they are innocent, maybe they are otherwise guilty. So, in the case of uh, those uh, guilty people, they will never accept that you know, they deserved a punishment. In the case of innocent people, they will always be cursing their destiny. So, how do we deal with them? We can only think of uh, the assistance of Mother Mary uh, and, you know, to, to tell them that uh, there is a victory of uh, truth one day. This victory of truth will be there one day. Was that uh, actually motivated Mother Mary? We, we never see, because, though we say mother, mother, mother of seven sorrows, I don't think that uh, even though we, we read in the Bible that Jesus cried, but we don't see Mother Mary cry. Nobody has ever recorded that she wept. She did not weep. Because she was convinced, because she was able to accept the reality and she knew about the promises of um, the Lord, that there is ultimate victory for truth. So this uh, ultimate victory of truth is something which we have to uh, uh, convey to those people who, according to them, they have been innocent. So when is that the victory of truth? It's very easy to say that truth will win. Yes, but it's difficult to convince them that there is uh, victory of truth. And this victory of truth, we need an emotional, we need a psychological, we need a spiritual uh, uh, three-dimensional approach to convince those people that there will be ultimate victory of truth. And uh, as far as the people who are convicted are concerned, we have to help them to realize that, you know, they have um, landed in that place because of uh, their own contributions also, their own contributions. So maybe they are partly guilty, they may not be fully guilty, etc. But then the second question we have to ask again is the second question we read in the Bible. Where is your brother? Where is your brother? See, only because a brother has been injured or a brother has been affected by his conduct, he has landed up. So he owes a duty to that brother. We must uh, we must not mince words in convincing him, making him realize that you know he has actually offended not only the society but a brother or a brothers or a family or a mother, whoever is you know, somebody, eh, another create, uh, created uh, 
person of God he has offended. He has violated the rights of others. He has inflicted injury on um, other uh, his own brothers and sisters. So this is the second reality he has to accept. Therefore, he needs to be told that you know that that person or uh, he or she needs to realize that you know by his or her conduct somebody else has been affected in the family or in the person. So with that person also a reconciliation needs to be done if this. Uh, person in the prison needs to have a real uh, what you call uh, reintegration because our ministry's role is to reintegrate them in society and rehabilitate them in their life so this reintegration will be possible only if this person is in the position to accept this reality that you know there is his involvement and on account of his conduct willful or otherwise somebody else has uh, uh, been wounded so that wound he needs to heal so how 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 does he heal the wound that may be by forgiveness um, um, uh, tendering pardon and asking for pardon reconciling with uh, uh, um, whatever is possible um, and repairing 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 the ills of his conduct that has actually um, you know wounded that person so this repairing is a further conduct uh, he or the family of uh, the prisoner need to take up as otherwise uh, there will not be peace in society there cannot be peace in society unless there is reconciliation we all uh, preach so much about the peace and development but uh, there is a great reality that we have to accept that we need to have a reconciliation Unfortunately, in the society, not only in prison uh, context, but I'm saying in society, we now there is hardly in reconciliation. Everybody is firm, everybody is firm and clear that his position is right. So, or his or her position is right. So they don't want to reconcile. They don't want to even respect the other side's position. They don't want to even agree and disagree. This is how the society goes now. We can read every day in the papers. Tell me where, where, where this uh, in our organized. Uh, um, churches take any denomination is there peace inside is there peace inside and we preach uh, so much of peace but is there peace inside take the case of parish take the case of a foreign take the case of diocese take the case of a denomination catholic orthodox jacobite csi martha Mite. You, you tell me any denomination, I can tell you how many cases they have, they are involved in courts. So I used to challenge them, if you people who stand for truth and justice and peace, decide to reconcile yourself uh, among yourselves uh, and withdraw uh, from the courts, one third of the space that you occupy in court can be relieved. The courts will be relieved. That will be the great, great contribution that you can give. I give an open call to them. But I, I do not find any positive, uh, I'm not judging it, this is my painful observation. I do not find any positive steps being taken for uh, uh, people concerned in the matter of reconciliation and forgiveness, forgiveness and reconciliation, rather forget and forgive and reconcile, and then withdraw from the court. We Christians are never ever uh, to be seen in court. I always felt very, uh, very disturbed whenever I see somebody in classic or somebody in a habit uh, in court because that has been that is not the place for you your place is somewhere else you are not supposed to be in court so why do you go to court against your own brother so this is a, a painful thought so that is the second thought third thought is actually uh, again in the context of uh, prison ministry we have to uh, convince them or we have to ask this question where are you going like this Kovadis, where are you going? Kovadis is asked in a different context by Peter again to Jesus. Where are you going? But we need to understand it in, a, in, the, in, the, in the literal sense. Uh, where are you? Uh, where are you? Where is your brother? And where are you going? Where are you going means, you know, you will come out of the prison. And then where are you going? Are you going in the old line? Are you going with the vengeance? Is your uh, mind full of this still vendetta? Have you ever thought of your family? Have you ever thought of the victim's family? 
and uh, you know this is the question we have to assist them uh, you know in, in realizing that you know they need to change the ways they need to change the mode they need to change uh, the, 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 the the real path which uh, actually landed them in trouble so this is, is actually um, in the in the path of um, rehabilitation rehabilitation this is that the rehabilitation process uh, mother mary uh, actually intervened in kena uh, this is actually a rehabilitation process actually no? uh, repair and rehabilitation uh, otherwise there would have been a lot of trouble so with mother mary's intervention also as a motherly uh, approach you know we have to tell we love you but uh, we want you to understand that uh, where are you we want you to understand that you know you have uh, often that's a, a, a brother or a sister and uh, we need to and we want to help you in your uh, future course we want you to help in your future course in the sense you know in the matter of reintegration to society and rehabilitation in life for that uh, uh, all the three uh, uh, things uh, which uh, uh, which which i just mentioned are really important let me just uh, come to the concluding two, three uh, aspects uh, which I wanted to tell is we need to convey to the people that we really love them. We really love them. What's the meaning of love? This meaning of love is actually, if you see, see the, uh, the teaching of the definition of love um, in the Catechism Catholic Church also. Anything that uh, uh, helps other, man's, um, uh, other man to come up in life see the good in life, to help him to come up in life, then only there's something called love. Otherwise, so any act, any thought, any intervention will help somebody else to come up in life, which helps to come up in life positively. A liberation could be a liberation, to be a help, it could be uh, taking him to a different, uh, uh, what you call, place where there is no darkness coming to the, the path of light, is also something that's love. So if you want to really love a person, we should know how to love that person. It's not simply saying that Jesus loves you. Uh, everybody knows Jesus loves us. But he'll ask a counter question. I know that Jesus loves me, but tell me how do you love me? This will be the counter question. How do we love you? So that he expects uh, the quality of a love which will help him to come back in life. So in the matter of spiritual um, reintegration. I feel that, you know, we should be in a position to tell two things to him. One, look at Jesus and get radiant. Look at Jesus and get radiant. Look at me and be radiant. So I should be in a position to say that, you know, I am able to be radiant because I look at him. So why am I not radiant? Why there is darkness in me? Because I am not looking at him. This Mother Teresa always insisted that you know, whatever service, whatever ministry, whatever you are involved in, unless you are in a position to be radiant and charged with this uh, power, you won't be in a position to show light to the world. So be radiant. Look at uh, Jesus and all. You can be radiant. We can be radiant only by looking at uh, Jesus. And Mother Mary always looked at him and him only, nowhere else. That's why she was always radiant. So look at uh, Jesus and be radiant. And the second assurance uh, we have to give to these people is fear not, only believe. Look at me and be radiant. Fear not, only believe. Fear not, only believe is, uh, is, is a reassurance in the spiritual sense. It's a reassurance in the material sense as well. If you believe that there is still life left in a person who has been convicted and uh, who has served his term in jail, we have to tell him, that you don't worry. You believe that you can, you must, and you will come back to life. This reassurance we have to give to him. And this can be given only if we are ourselves convinced that, you know, fear not, only believe. The sphere not only believe is uh, something which we have to uh, take them forward as far as family is concerned. And then let me come to the final part because I, I need some time to have some interaction also with you, which uh, Father also told in this ministry. Uh, as far as uh, 
this uh, the, the, the situation of the family is concerned. See, the moment uh, a prisoner comes to know that you know the family is actually uh, consoled and getting connected, that you know that is not disconnected from the mainstream and that is uh, taken care of uh, emotionally and spiritually, there will be a lot of change reflected in the person in the prison. That is something very important. We hardly think about those uh, families of those poor people who have uh, been in prison. In the Nirbhaya's uh, case also, I, I, in fact, uh, even when that uh, mother of Nirbhaya has been clamoring for the lives of these persons, uh, in fact, I made an open public statement uh, uh, that, you know, it's not problem. So you have to think about the, the family of those other persons also. Yes, I do not, I did not say that, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not a happy, no doubt about it. But the thing about their psychological, social, economic, and other backgrounds also, and their families also, what are they going to gain? Did uh, any harassment stop? I always ask this question. Uh, are you, there are some sisters also uh, listening to me, are you in a position to walk alone in, in, in any street in India, maybe after 10 o'clock, as we do? I can walk at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock alone in any street, but will you? You won't be able to. Still, why? Well, there is a mind. There needs to be a, a change in the mindset of the people. This uh, deterrence by your punishment will not uh, um, by itself give uh, any change, introduce any change in the mindset of the people. It needs a lot of other social interventions we need to change the psyche of the people. So this rehabilitation part, the connect with the family of uh, those people in prison is very important. This is where I wanted to conclude my little reflections with the role of Mother Mary. Mother Mary, uh, we have visitation, no? the, the feast of visitation. The greatest uh, uh, and the warmest thing that we can do is simply to visit. So visit the, the, the families of those uh, uh, convicts and victims. Because this reconciliation, we can uh, bring forward, even when this convicted person is in jail, with the victim and the family of the convict also. So our visit, and just as Mother Mary on her own, volunteer, this is ours also is a volunteering work, volunteerism. This is something uh, uh, which we have seen a lot uh, in prison ministry, um, volunteerism. So our volunteering um, for um, uh, bringing out uh, reconciliation between the families of uh, the victim and the accused, our, our intervention will make a lot effect. Because the convicted person is in jail, but we are there to connect these two families. And if this is uh, happening, I understand, I am of the view that this prison ministry uh, will be able to work wonders because by the time this person comes out of jail, the peace has already been restored between the victim and the accused. And this is actually the role of um, uh, reintegration uh, rather than rehabilitation. Reintegration is more important than rehabilitation, according to me, in the prison ministry because our role is more in reintegration uh, rather than rehabilitation. And Mother Mary is the best example in that process uh, in thinking about uh, uh, the, the visits, uh, the visitation of Mother Mary, uh, where she felt her service is required.